been with um, Kiamoku Kapo. He's going to do a Kaya Fox. to leave the doors and the windows open because of the open of our perhaps to our elementary within the discussion for today. Hey, Hawaii, Moko, Keawe, Kaya, Kalai, Puka, Maila, Ayala, Omaunya, Nahono, Pila, Ninuya, Kamakaula, Nanoe, Hareaka, Puka, Maila, Kikiki, Akana, Loa, 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 Kalai, Hano, Hano, Keali, Jahi, Hi, Iki akola no ila na ika ula la au kua ela ke aloha o kuku pehe u ike kapa ma moloka i o moloka i la i uli o o e o o a huo ke ole o kaku e mo kui kui vale o ka ala i kawa ni hali a kana ni makaua i o mano kala ni po mano mano ke o ni a o no hiri Tiri mai la o ni i hao taina ka hele la ni kaina i u hi a tu pu pu e Ah, makula ni mana kemana? Oh, nak mule 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 buat mana? Buat kalai nak buat mana? Eh, alohai, alohai, alohai nak kubunah mesti bagi aina wahai nuya kia. Alohai, alohai. Ano Aike Aloha and welcome to the Protecting Kuliana Lands Forum. Today, I'm mahalo for signing in for everyone who signed in. I'm today's moderator, Ovao Helene Sonora Pale, no Kulio O Mayao, Ovao O Kaluna Komike, O Kalapui Hawaii Political Action Committee. I'm Helene Sonora Pale, I'm from Kulio O, and I'm the chair of the Kalapui Hawaii Political Action Committee, which is a co sponsor of this forum today. Uh, I want to mahalo the Council for Native Hawaiian Advancement for giving us this space to have th this important discussion on Kuliana lands. Um, and just kind of, just if, if you, any of you don't know, have no idea what Kuliana lands are and why we're here today, um, as, a, as the Native people of this land, as the Indigenous people of this land, as the Kanaka Maoli of this Aina, our well-being is tied to the land. And so Kuliana lands is an issue that we really need to look at. It's not, um, it's not been uh, addressed, I think, um, for 170 years since 1850s. Um, the the Maka'inana got less than 1% of all lands in Hawaii. These lands were supposed to help empower us as a people. But when you look at where we are today, we make up 40% of the houseless. We make up the biggest population incar incarcerated in today's prisons and jails. Uh, we have the worst statistics. And our Kuliana landowners are in dire straits because of the, of, of the greed um, of um, land ownership. I mean, our, any land, any piece of land in Hawaii is, is valuable today. Any piece. You could own a rock and it would be valuable. So right now I feel at this point in time, we really need to address this issue, and it really needs to, as Kuliana landowners, we need to have extra protections. So I want to give, um, I want to introduce our, our speakers today. I'm very, very honored and happy that they're here today. Three of them are from Maui, so we have um, over-representation from Maui today, but <laughs> Maui has been holding the line for Kuliana landowners, I and mean, that's where the issue's been, um, been that's kind of like the, the front line of the issue. Okay, so our first speaker um, I want to introduce is Alan Murakami, and he's a distinguished staff attorney with the Native Hawaiian Legal Corps. If any of you want more information, by the way, I just want to point to, we do have a, um, a handout that has their biography, so you can get more information on their expertise and their background. But he's actually litigated many Kuliana land court cases. Uh, Lance Collins, who is a Maui attorney uh, in private practice and a Hawaiian Slicks graduate as well, which, and so I, I went to college with him. He's an advocate uh, as uh, for Aloha Aina today. Most recently, he wrote a letter on behalf of Kahea um, against their use of the LRAD. I don't, I don't know if you remember that, not, not that long ago. Uh, Keomoku Kapu, uh, who is a Kuliana landowner himself and a community, cultural, and political leader who heads Na'aikane O Maui LLC. Very honored to have him. And Kaniala Ng, 
who was a representative, a member of the House of Representatives from the uh, 111th, from the 11th district, representing South Maui from November 7, 2012 to November 6, 2018. So I want to welcome him. He's also from Maui. <laughs> um, Alan, are you from Maui? Hilo. Hilo, okay. So we have one Hilo person here. <laughs> okay, great. So we're going to um, get started because um, it's we only have an hour and 15 minutes to have this discussion to get into the content of what Kuliana lands are, how, how we're going to move forward. Um, and because we're a political action committee, we are, we're really about um, finding solutions and ways forward. So we're hoping to come out hopefully with something. Um, this forum is being videotaped as well, so it'll be on Olalo, and it will also be on um, our website. Okay, so, uh, so the first question I have is actually for Lance Collins. It's probably the hardest question, <laughs> well, one of the hardest questions. Um, so as a Hawaiian Studies graduate and as a, you know, a, an attorney, a practicing attorney who has some or has, I, I think you have a lot of knowledge in, um, in Hawaiian lands, and Crown government, and Kuleana lands. What are Kuleana lands? Okay, uh, mahalo for having me. Aloha, everybody. Aloha. Um, so, <clears throat> I, I think the best way to explain what Kuleana lands are is to explain the context um, that they exist in. And I think just so that we can all be on the same page, I, I'm sure everybody here knows um, on some level what Kuleana lands are, so I don't want anybody to feel like I'm trying to teach somebody. Um, uh, so um, at the time of the uh, Mahele, uh, one, about one third of uh, the land in Hawaii was um, was, I guess you'd say it was given, uh, or it was carved up so that one third went to the um, Ali'i Nui. And uh, without going into a long extended discussion of what the intent or the purpose was uh, of the Mahele, um, the effect was, um, was that there was concern that what had occurred at the Mahele actually would have the effect of uh, taking um, the people off of the land. And so uh, legislation was passed shortly after the Mahale to um, correct, correct that or to try to ensure that those concerns wouldn't occur. I'm sorry, am I, uh, do I need to speak in my mic? Okay. Um, and so the, the Kuleana Lands Act was created to allow um, the Maka'ainana to make claims um, for the land that they were using, uh, in particular Ahutua. Uh, and so um, those claims were made with respect to the land that had already been carved up in the uh, Mahele. Uh, but I think there were, there were over 20,000 claims that were made um, for folks who were using lands in different places. Um, and I think by the end, uh, of the adjudication of those claims, I think 12,000 of those claims uh, were uh, resulted in uh, an award of lands, and so those are the those those lands are the Kuleana lands, and those are the lands uh, one of the types of lands that the Hawaiian people uh, have claims to, and uh, different than the Crown lands and. and the kingdom government lands, uh, the Kuleana lands uh, that a Hawaiian has a connection to is um, based on uh, each person's specific mo'okuauhau. And so coming uh, into contact uh, with your Kuleana lands means uh, coming into contact with your mo'okuauhau and all of the skills uh, and all of the things that can happen when you uh, come into close contact with the Mo'okuo Hau, as opposed to Crown Lands, which is uh, really the birthright of every Hawaiian, um, uh, you know, as a, as a nation, as a Lahui. So um, I, that's, I 
hopefully that answers the question. Thank you. Thank you, Lance. Anybody want to add to his definition of what Kuliana lands are? Kiamoko? I allow my kako. Um, I, I think it all started uh, for me uh, some years ago on clarifying, you know, determining what basically what Kuliana lands were. And it took me some years, over 20 something years, to really realize that we have an undivided interest to land that was awarded during the time of the crown. So that kind of pursued me into the direction of finding clarity of, first of all, my identity and character, and it has a lot to do with our mo'oku or how, um, from an origin of a place of where we resided during the time of the kingdom and how important of a role that Kuleanas played uh, being placed in a position on how those lands were transferred from the Mahele down to an heir that was awarded the property to the Mahele and was placed in the indices award. So these are the kind of things. Now I gotta be clear, I'm not an attorney. Okay, so. But just the years of going through a lot of the litigations that I've been kind of bombarded with had to force me to really start doing the work on what needed to be done to find clarity as pertaining to what my Kuliano was and how I tied directly with lands that was awarded from the time of the kingdom to my Kukuna. And that's where I found clarity as pertaining to we have kind of an undivided interest that was awarded to our families, then when you get into this context of how the judiciary fo foresees this, that's not an animal. When you start talking about criminal, civil, land court, all these kind of things, understanding those kind of things. So I, I was kind of infatuated of learning what I needed to learn in order for me to step up and answer to complaints that came from public notices of companies filing adverse position claims by title claims. So I was forced into the position like being given a battlefield promotion and forced to deal with what needed to, I needed to deal with until it went against me then that's when I had to seek help from the legal side on an attorney to help clarifies certain issues, but my first case ended, uh, started with me filing a pro se, as a pro se, to um, find clarity as pertaining to my connection to these Kuleana land. So it was a self-talk thing for a bit until things started to get complicated in understanding the process of how we, we get kind of put into a box. And these kind of things are, are not set out there for everybody to know unless in, you're inquisitive to know these kind of things and you're going to follow up what needs to be done. So for me, clarity on what Kuliano lands are is we have a responsibility. So Kuliano lands to me is a responsibility that was passed down for our, from our kupuna. And if we don't pursue those responsibilities, then we would never know what's in it for us or what is at stake. So that's all I can add. Thank you. Thank you, you Kiamoku. Um, so Lance, what, um, so you were talking about um, that uh, the number of people that got lands um, from the Kuliana lands. What was the process, do you know, of getting Kuliana lands? So who could get Kuliana lands and what was the process? So um, the process was that um, somebody would make a claim to the Board of Commissioners to Quiet Land Titles, and then um, they would go and receive testimony from whoever the witness, whoever brought witnesses, and occasionally there would be conflicting testimony, but most of the time it was uncontested. Um, and then if they found that the claim was sound, they would uh, issue a land commission award. Um, of course, what happened in uh, many cases is that um, the claimant would um, 
get ill and, and pass away of measles or smallpox or whatever, and if somebody else who was on the land, either the spouse or the children or the parent, didn't pursue the claim, then the claim would just collapse. Um, and so, okay, so back to if you get a, if, if your kupuna got a land commission award, um, then that, uh, for legal purposes uh, at the time, basically meant that you had conclusive proof of superior ownership of the land, except as to the government. And you could perfect your title um, by either paying the commutation tax, or if it was in an area that was not subject to that, basically you would just fill out the paperwork and get a royal patent. Um, but even if a royal patent wasn't issued, um, getting a land commission award meant that you had that your kupuna had superior title um, as to everybody in the world except for the crown until the commutation tax was paid or the royal patent otherwise was, was issued. And then at that point, that even the crown did not have superior uh, claim to to that particular land. Thank you. So the it was the makainana. Yes. The, the commoners that were the awardees of these Kuliana lands. Yes. Um, that was in, that was the Kuliana Land Act of 1850. Awesome, thank you, Gantz. Okay, so um, that's some background on what Kuliana land is and why is it an issue? Why, um, how many of you know what Kuliana lands are? Raise your hand or have an idea. How many of you have Kuliana lands or have families that have Kuliana lands? Okay, great. Okay, so there, some of you do have some background, but a lot of us, a lot of the, uh, even Kanaka Maoli that I know, never knew what Kudiana lands were. Um, it was, you know, just like we were raised, never knowing about the overthrow and things like that. We never really knew, um, a, a lot of things were not shared with us. And so, why did this issue come up? There's Kuliana land owners today that don't even know that they have Kuliana lands. And so, what was it? that made it explode most recently. And I, wanna, I want Kaniala Ng to kind of speak to that, um, with what happened a couple, few years ago. Hello. Aloha mai kako. Uh, yeah, I think I'm just gonna back up real quick. When, when you look at the way land has been distributed to native and indigenous people, not just in Hawaii, but across America and the world, especially in America, it's been done so in a way that is inherently, knowingly unsustainable. So you give 1% of land to the majority of a population, knowing that in two generations, their family would have to split it among 10, 20 people in different lines. Um, I think there was one corporation that is trying to build a massive project on one of our islands today called Our People Noisy and Colorful. Um, the assumption of a quiet title, the presumption is it's a noisy title because no one person has ownership, although that's a foreign concept for Native peoples. Um, all land is quote unquote noisy. Uh, so that being in consideration, you have a billionaire, right? The most, I think third most, third richest man in the world, uh, Mark Zuckerberg. Right, who owns a platform that can dictate, that can control the way we communicate with one another today. Uh, so he's also one of the most powerful people in the world. Um, he decides to, to buy 700 acres on the island of Kauai, beautiful beachfront, I think this is that kind of area that they shoot like Avatar and those movies in. Um, gorgeous, gorgeous land. Uh, and not, not even going into the community, because you build, you go to any rural town anywhere in the world and you try to buy three acres as a rich person, everybody's gonna be like, whoa, 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 brother, like, let's talk about this. He didn't do that. He didn't even show up. He just went ahead and bought it. And in order to quiet the title, he went ahead and sued all the families that had um, claimed the land through Kuleana rights. Uh, when these kinds of things happen, you can, we can delude ourselves to thinking that we can fight in court and beat a billionaire with all the best lawyers in the world and spend, and even if we do, we're spending insane amounts of resources doing so. 
Or we can think about this as this is some brother who loves his reputation, that once a one day looks like he wants to run for president, um, let's make this a media battle instead. Right, so that was my MO. Um, I was chair of Hawaiian, I was chair of Hawaiian Affairs at the time in the State House. So, um, you know, we got together, I got together with other uh, Kanaka Maoli representatives, one of them in the room. Uh, he's now a senator, Jericho Okalole. We put our heads together, and he's right there, Kio Okalole, over there in the white. Yeah, looking very fit. <laughs> Uh, and we got our heads together, and we, I mean, then we called um, NHLC, talked to Moses, talked to Alan, talked to a few other folks, and we said, "What can be done? This is this is Heva. Um And we came out with a bill. Well, I mean, first we went to the media. We said, "Hey, um, in Hawaii, we don't initiate conversations by suing our neighbors, right? Because that was the first time he even went into the community was a lawsuit. Uh, this litigious uh, billionaire. So." Already, he was like off on the wrong ground. He was playing defensive. Um, uh, shout out to Pacific Islanders and Communications if anyone is in this room, but um, it's really like a lot of everything that happens these days happens on that level in the media. It's unfortunate, but um, you know, it's always better to be on the offensive and shaping your own narrative than on the defensive. Um, and as you can see that with the way that Mauna is playing out in the state, um, the state is really trying to play the offensive. So we want it to be the ones as Kanaka, for once, shaping our own narrative. So uh, things went through, we introduced the bill, um, it gained some traction, a lot of Kanaka were waking up to it, we were able to tell our story to media all across the nation, even like The Guardian and Al Jazeera, like international publications, uh, we were able to like, talk about it in CNN and everything. So we really shined the light on um, what Native Hawaiians are going through today, and the inequities in our system, and how it's weighted so heavily towards the plaintiffs in these cases. Um, the bill did not make it the first time around. Uh, one reason is because they just passed a quiet title reform about a year before that, two years before that, that didn't go nearly far enough. The other reason, it, this is something that I'll talk about later on, probably not the appropriate question, but uh, it's just the, t the power that's behind the lawsuits, the lawyers that do quiet title lawsuits. There are two firms in Honolulu that specialize in this, both of those firms have attorneys that donate massive amounts of money to political campaigns. They tend to sit on a lot of boards and commissions in our state. And if you're gonna disrupt, if they're gonna make less money if this bill were to pass, it's gonna be a really hard bill to pass. So uh, that was something we dealt with. It didn't pass that first year, but there was enough pressure on Mark Zuckerberg where he dropped the lawsuits. Um, that's not to say that everything is hunky-dory. Um, there are uh, developments now that um, those same families are being threatened through another mechanism. But um, yeah, it just, this, this wasn't the first time this was happening. This was just a modern day example with a very high profile person that were able to shine a light on generations of injustices against Native Hawaiians. Oh, thank you, Kanela. That was a good summary. Thanks. Um, um, so the next question, and, and so what, what, what's happening and what's happened over the generations is that, um, the, well, let's say that the, the average Kuliana land award was about 3.3 acres per family. And only males could, could actually um, claim title to Kuliana lands. And um, what's happened is, you know, generation by generation, we've had plantations pushing these small Kuliana land owners out We've had even commitment schools had a hand in pushing some of them out. Um, our own trust. We had um, we had uh, ranchers pushing these small land owners out, um, surrounding them and pushing them out. Um, and today we have um, billionaires like Zuckerberg, and we also I think the new threat now is short-term housing rentals on the on the neighbor islands. Um, you know, pushing. Kuliana land owners out as well, making Hawaiian communities a uh, playground for tourists. So, um, and, and I'm not, and I'm saying these things as it's my perspective. I'm not saying that it, it reflects on them. It's a little radical, right? I mean, maybe <laughs> they don't agree with me, but um, I, next I want to just ask um, Kiamoku, who is a Kuliana land owner and who has gone up against a uh, big land owner uh, on Maui. Uh, was it Mikila? 
was it um, West Maoriland? Yeah, Kemoku. If you can share some, your experience going up against and protecting your Kuliana. Well, I, I think first of all, I got to credit my dad. Um, because if it wasn't for him, we would never have known. So he told us that we got to go home. 1970, uh, because of 1970, he said there was uh, an issue that we needed to take care of. So we went home in 1996, kind of like the cutoff year for, um, and this is what I, I started to discover that the, that year was kind of a cutoff year for the 20, 20 year adverse possession claim by okay. anyone. So it's kind of magically appeared why my father said that he used to get these dreams and Kupuna was telling him, we gotta come home, we gotta come home now. We gotta go Malamara property now. So my father, we used to meet and he used to tell us we need to make preparations to go home because this Wahini coming in his dreams and telling him, you know, hele mai, hele mai, and she never had one face. And for me, I'm the runt of the family. There's seven of us. My sister Pauline is here present in the front. My sister Kwailani is the genealogist within our family, so everybody played an important part, all except for me. I guess I was a sacrificial lamb that needed to place myself on the aina to make sure that nobody passes in despite of how this thing was to come about. So um, we went home and the process of going home was horrendous that I had to get with Pine and Mill uh, Sugar Company and tell them I needed the key so we could go home. And they came up to me and said that I needed to sign one waiver. So I read the paper saying that they're allowing me position, uh, permission to enter on their lands. I refused to sign the paper saying that it's not their lands that I'm going to, it's my ancestral lands that I'm going to for to check up on my my father's inquiry about burials that were here, my family, uh, Juliana had a palina of multiple burials in the area. So it boiled down to me not signing a waiver and just with a handshake, they gave me the keys. So by them giving me the keys, I went home and I built my house. Then I locked them up. <laughs> then from there on, the first thing happened in 1999, 2000, about 2001, there was a quiet title action case in my valley, which I filed pro se. And uh, <laughs> I'm one person that anytime you had a, a, a notice in a public notice about somebody filing a quiet title any place in Maui, I would show up at court to answer to the argument or the complaint that was before the courts. And um, I don't know why I did that, but I felt that I needed to do it. But the property that I filed against uh, to answer to the argument was a property that I knew that was related to us. And knowing that when they said that uh, Makila Land Company is filing a quiet title uh, to my that died in 1868, that kind of scratched my head a little bit to say that, okay, they're filing out a quiet title on my kubuna that died back then, that cannot represent himself today, that I would have to be the, the vehicle to be the one to file the argument against the argument to, to figure out, okay, how does this whole thing work? So when I filed, um, I went back to court and they set a trial date, then I put my papers together of what I, I thought. There's, there's, there's not a manual in there that says uh, quiet titles for dummies. <laughs> yeah, so I just kind of mimicked some court cases before and I answered the argument as best as I could and I submitted it. And as soon as I walked in the door, 10 minutes later, the judge, Shackley Rivera, said judgment to the plaintiff and I was stuck. So from that time, I met this attorney. It was a small, time attorney, his name was Richard McCarty, and he helped me file the appeal for the Intermediate Court of Appeals, and from that time, six years went by, or four years went by, and the Court of Appeals uh, came back and said that um, 
the courts, Maui, Shackley Referral, Judge Shackley Referral notoriously granted summary judgment to West Maui Land Company or Makila Land Company, whereas the appellate courts remained decision to Kemoku Kapu. So that started a whole new uh, journey for me on really picking up the pace as pertaining to what I needed to do if I needed to file declarations or affidavits and things like that. It was, it was a new era for me at the same time. I get this Howley attorney who was a small time attorney and all he did was like um, uh, injuries and construction work injuries and all that kind of stuff. So he said, one day he said, I'm here to help you. And I looked at him and I kind of chuckled <laughs> and said, what one Howley guy gonna do for me when complicated rhetoric world that we live, especially based on title. So it was a kind of a learning process on how we needed to educate each other on just the concept of Kuleana lands and where I come in and the information that he needed to implement. So throughout all those years, um, I lost him in 2015. He died. Then I was in like dire strait because my court case finally, after nine years of waiting, when it got remanded back, the company just kind of laid back and said, ah, we're not worried about that, we'll let this thing idle. And it idled for nine years, and despite of the appellate court saying remand decision to the circuit court for final summary judgment, they sat on it. They sat on it because they were, there was all these quiet titles going off around me. So they found quite title on the property I was living, quite title on my dad's park, uh, place. They filed quiet titles on every property that had kapu. And I've been stuck in court um, for a long time on a total of six cases simultaneously. I lost a lot. And when this one came up, the one that I originally filed pro se, I was in dire streets, I called uh, everybody that I could. I sat down with the trustee, our Maui trustee, Office of Hawaiian Affairs, and they took my documents and I sent my papers wherever I could go and try to get some help and nobody helped. So finally I reached out and I, I sent one email to Lance and Lance came back and said, I'm gonna help you. So. family is very indebted for this man. And at the same time, it, it, it gave me strength to pursue other things like helping other families. Because after uh, my case came out, the jury trial and the determination from that original trial says that Keomoku Kapu has an interest, whereas Makila Land Company owns no interest to Land Commission Award uh, 6507. So because of that, that became the the opening, the new opening pandanus box where now I'm pursuing to help other families that are going to the same um, pilikia when it comes to them, the, the type of papers that they need. So we kind of just put something real simple together on how families can file an affidavit um, to tie themselves to the the original land already from the time of the Maheli. And it's all based on an undivided interest. That everybody has an undivided interest. So if you had, your kupuna had brothers and sisters, then all of a sudden one of those kupunas so it signed property over to these companies. What happened to the other kupunas? So a lot of these uh, milk companies take an assumption saying that well, your kupuna named Jacob and signed his property over. They go, yeah, but Jacob was my kupuna's brother. Mm -hmm. So a lot of them, that's where I started to understand. And when it came to, uh, now today, we lost one in McKenna, it was my grandmother's property, true one, um, partition of land for sale. All because they know that we had an interest, but they had an interest too, so they partitioned the courts for, for the property to be auctioned off. And that's another way we started to lose where Zuckerberg comes in 
now that Zuckerberg owns only a portion of the lands that he can petition the courts for the land to be sold off and leaves all these families to start and trouble. And that's why I think it's really important for me and real gracious for Kanye Alagi for introducing this because now it sets the playing field a little bit more easier for Kulianas that are going through all these horrendous trials and tribulations saying that first of all, we gotta mediate to see whether or not these landowners even have the, the right amount of property to even partition up the courts for sale. These are just the kind of things that I've learned and I've been persistent and persistent and now I'm hoping to, from this and from the help of my attorney here, that we can go out and help other families. It's all about families that are, are, are kind of stuck with financial and all these kinds of things, how I used to be and how I was. So I'm dedicating what I've learned from my attorney prior and what I've learned from Lance this far and going out there and helping other families connect. So I'm um, um, So, uh, Last question to uh, for the first round is to um, Alan and uh, Alan Murakami. And, uh, so what are some of the challenges and issues that Kuliana landowners face today that you've, in your experience as someone who's litigated these cases on their behalf, uh, working for Native Hawaiian Legal Corps? Okay, uh, that's a question with a big answer. Um, I don't know if we have all the time to answer that, but um, let me say this about the Kuleana, uh, which is a type of land holding, but it's special. It's special because it was originally meant to be owned by the Makainana, who were supposed to end up with 30, 30, 30, a third of the land in Hawaii after the, the, the Mahele. You have to catch myself from saying the great Mahele because in so many ways, it was not very great for Hawaiians. Um, but because of the kinds of problems that Lance kind of hinted at, you know, the cost, uh, the, the need to understand the process, the, the distances involved having to claim Kuleana when you live on Kauai or Big Island way in the Kohibi, it's, it was very difficult. And from what I read, at least only 30% of any of the claims actually filed for Kulana were actually awarded. Um, and even the total number of claims filed were very were very minimal compared to what the population was. And so we really ended up with something like just under 8,000 awards involving only about 28,000 acres. There's 4 million acres in Hawaii, okay? So you can see the minuscule percentage that that represents. So for the Native Hawaiian Legal Corporation, we made it a priority to preserve Kuleana whenever possible. But there are real formidable obstacles to trying to do that. And it's not all anybody's fault, but just, we start from a small base and then we have the problem of what they call due process of law, which means that every court in the land has to respect property rights of individuals. And that can cut both ways. It, it helps you because if you can prove that you own the property, your property rights are supposed to be respected um, so that it, does, it cannot just be simply taken away without any compensation. But on the other hand, if somebody buys a portion of that same property, even a 5% share in it, that entitles that person uh, or that entity or that ranch or that estate to file a claim in court and say, hey, I own 5% of this land. I want a petition to um, uh, carve it up and or if it can't be carved up, sell it. And most Kulian are too small to be carved up because they do not meet the standards for county requirements for minimum lot size. So you can't take a half acre Kulian and cut it in half and then split it between two people uh, because of applicable zoning laws and, and that kind of limitation. So when you don't have enough land to split amongst the people that do have an interest in that land, and there can be many. We've had Kuleana cases where the people that come to us own uh, you know, less than a 50th interest in the land. 
And you're talking about a half acre to a, a couple of acres of land. That ain't much. Uh, so you really at a disadvantage because as time passes, as the generations come and go, every generation there's new offspring, right? You gotta split that property by the number of, of offspring that they are. You go down about five generations, and pretty, pretty soon you're dealing with over 100 people. That's not unusual. Um, if you can find them. And sometimes we can't even find them. So there's huge obstacles just practically to being able to retain Kuliana. So we, do the, we try to do the genealogical research and the title research to try to find those properties that come to us in litigation that we can hopefully save in the name of uh, Kuliana owners. But it's not easy, I gotta tell you that. Just from the passage of time and the generations that have passed on, um, as, as Kelvin probably knows, you know, they're not the only one, right, in those lands. And so it becomes difficult once you get to the partition phase to try to, to you know, divvy up the property to everybody that owns an interest. And that 5% owner who bought into that property could easily then say, I, well then I petitioned to sell this property. And that's when you have the kind of courthouse auctions uh, that result from quiet title actions because you can't divvy up your property uh, legally so that everybody can share in it. So you, the only option is to sell it. And you can sell it by a private sale, you can sell it on the courthouse steps, which is the very worst option. Because that's probably gonna yield the least amount of money. It's whoever shows up that day with a requisite amount of money in a, either a cashier's check or cash. And that really limits the amount of bidding that can go on. So you, you end up with these auctions of Kodiana or other lands that are involved that need to be sold at really dirt cheap prices. And you will see people hanging around courthouses on auction days, uh, looking for these kinds of land deals because they know they can get it cheap if they, as long as they got an, a bucket of money that they can outbid the other guy with. So ownership is a big issue at Kuliana. It's one of the biggest obstacles we face. And they're small, you have huge numbers of generational uh, succession that makes ownership real widespread and very difficult to have a situation where you can actually hold a property as, as land. Uh, in Kuliana, despite the intention to give this, these lands to the Makainano so they could live on them. And that was the intention, so people could live productively on their land, they could farm, they could fish, they could trade, they could have access to the mountain and access to the ocean. To the mountain for goods that people gathered and for other purposes, to the ocean for our food, um, to complement whatever color or other products you grow in the land. These are rights that were in, in, embedded in the, all the titles in Hawaii, as it turns out. They got long forgotten by most of the large landowners especially, and sometimes by the courts and judges that are ruling over these, uh, making these rulings of affecting Kuleana land. Kuleana owners have specific rights to access and to, um, to water that few other properties literally have on, on, their, on the face of their title. And so, not only Kuliana constitute a small percentage of the number of lands in Hawaii, but they have very, valu very valuable rights that attach to them, and um, rights that are unique to any other type of land, frankly. So, it is a priority with our office to try to find the situations we can preserve Kuliana rights, and we have taken cases that involve things like when, as some, some of you have mentioned, you know, the larger landowner who owns hundreds of acres are on a Acre Kuliana will block off all the, all the access over a period of time. And if, you know, as people uh, find themselves in a quandary because they gotta go up against this large landowner to get access, um, oftentimes the Kuliana has been abandoned, frankly, uh, with the loss of life from disease and migration into the cities. A lot of Kuliana lands were left uh, basically abandoned. And then new generations that tried to come back with fine fences and all kinds of obstacles to block their access. So we've had cases where we tried to reopen that access. And there are cases in Hawaii that are uh, that stand for that proposition that Kuliana, all Kuliana have a right of access. That was guaranteed in the awards that were given to the lands around them that they had to be subject to the rights of Kuliana owners. So, Access rights are there, but many people didn't appreciate that, nor knew about them. 
Uh, so we have to step in to try to enforce those access rights. Um, we did that in the in the very case that Mr. Zuckerberg was inv involved in. Not in that case, but in the lands that, it, that, that, that were involved there. Because the uh, one of the former owners, Jimmy Fluger, was blocking access, one of the Kuliana owners. So we had to go in there and fight for the access rights to get to the Kuliana. Uh, so it's those kinds of issues that are really make it challenging for Kuliana owners because who can go to court most times to fight for that, those access rights? It's an expensive process. And if there's something that can be done to lower the cost of that in legislation, that would be really good. Um, in addition, they have water. People have blocked water. We had the East Maui water case where the Kuliana that are are inherent in the Wailu, Nua, and Kenai Valleys had to fight for the water over decades to get the water finally returned to those valleys. And yet, they had the superior right to water that no other property owner had, including ANB and Mike Bona, by the way. They had no rights to the water that they were able to, to convince the state to allow them to export that water some 25 miles into central Maui. But if you look at the legal history of water rights, the, I'm gonna just say this as a tidbit for you to know, but in 1906, Alexander and Baldwin on the Kuliana in the, in the Central Valley of Maui, and it was they were fighting with uh, the uh, another sugar company that owned the property around it, and they wanted uh, they wanted their water, and they they went to court and they won. They won because they were a Kuliana owner. They had bought out a Kuliana uh, owner, and they they enforced their rights to water over the lands that had blocked water from upstream coming down to the Kuliana. That is the same principle that they were enforcing and on the, with the shoe on the other foot against our clients who were Kuliana owners. And then because of their sheer political power, frankly, they were able to continue diverting this water despite the superior rights to the Kuliana uh, owners who had a superior right to water to, wa to water their, 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 their column in amounts that were similar to that which was historically needed to cook column. And that's the formulation that these cases uh, have uh, developed for Kuliana owners. When you talk about water law in Hawaii, one of the big ones was McBride. It really shifted the thinking about water rights in Hawaii. This 1973 case was lasted about 50 years. And the thing about it, I think about in that McBride case was that despite, this was a fight between Kodahiki owners of land, that they had the right to water uh, over the other. But in all that litigation, and all that tons of history, what they did the boat, with each sugar company assumed and conceded was the right to Kuliano uh, owners' water rights was were to be respected. They were fighting over the surplus water that in, in excess of whatever water Kuliano owners downstream needed to the groin of taro. And so uh, it's, it wasn't an unknown right, um, but oftentimes in history, with all the changes that in a tumultuous history in Hawaii, I think people tend to forget that Hawaiians have rights. Yeah. You know, and it, it, it frankly it was kind of dumbfounding on me that some of this stuff was going on for years and years and years. We spend half our time at the Native Hawaiian Legal Corporation simply trying to enforce right that, rights that already exist. I mean, I basically tell people in negotiations, hey, we don't, we're not making this shit up. <laughs> it's there, it's in the Constitution, it's in the statutes. Right now, because of the 1978 amendments to the Constitution, there are very important rights that have been preserved as a matter of constitutional law, which means these are laws that can't even be changed by, by the legislature without a full vote of the electorate. And these are rights that are that every elected official, including the former ones, swore to uphold, correct? You swear to uphold the Constitution, the state of Hawaii. That's in your oath of office. And that's why we had to remind legislators and the others that were, frankly, allies of A and B, that we're not respecting these rights over the, the course of the decades that we uh, fought to get water back to Wailua, Noe, and Kenai Valleys. Uh, so, that's a short version, I think, of what I was going to say. <laughs>
I was like, wow. <laughs> Thank you, Alan. Yeah, um, so if any of you don't know, we do have a copy of a bill right now that's alive in the house. It's 1470. It has language in there that we, um, we like. Um, and some of the, the it, it actually makes, um, it makes it mandatory uh, for uh, the defendants and plaintiffs to go into mediation if the defendant wants. Um, it consolidates actions uh, into one, so if it's multiple owners of one kuniana. Um, and it also, um, it, one of the interesting things I found with kuniana lands is how if you as a um, defendant are being sued for, or your land is being quite titled and you have to go to court, you may be responsible for the fees that the plaintiff incurs and talk about a system that works against Hawaiians. Talk about a, you know, it's, it, that's, that's unjust. That's an unjust um, situation. Um, so what we want to do is, you know, try to move forward with kind of helping to correct the situation. Um, giving, because there's so little of us left uh, as Kuliana landowners, uh, out here in Hawaii, hanging, I mean, 170 years is incredible. Having held on, if so for some of us who are, have our lands, having held on to that for 170 years, if you think about it, you know, um, we held on to it after the, during the overthrow, during the republic, um, during the oligarchy period of rule over Hawaii. I mean, um, plantations, we were up against um, ranchers, we were up against big business. Um, development, families have still held on to it for 170 years, and that to me is incredible. So how, as um, a Lahui, because um, a lot of us here, you know, are leaders in our own right, can we um, help ensure that these families continue to stay on their ancestral lands? Because if you think about it, they weren't there from the 1850s. They were there from before. They had to have been living on the lands. So these are lands that they've held generations back. It's not 170 years of occupation. It's it's more than that. They've been there for hundreds of years. And so how do we, as a Lahui, move forward and, and help our Ohanas, our, our Kanaka Maoli Lahuis, hang on to these lands? Um, and so that, that's the next part of the questions. And it's pretty much the same question for all of them. Um, uh, basically, so question to all of you, with your unique understanding and expertise regarding Kuliana lands, what do you think can or should be done to help Kuliana landowners stay on their ancestral lands? And can you start with Kaniala Ng? I'll try to be sure to give the experts um, a little bit more time and the people that have faced these cases themselves. Uh, but on the political side, um, as I alluded to earlier, is there's a lot of power on one side, institutional power. And on our side, there are everyday folks who are just trying to make it day by day. Um, they're not able to often come to the legislature because they got jobs or they have other kuleana at home. Um, so it's already, and as we, as we heard, um, you know, we have a justice system that relies on money. So it's not always that the two people entering the room are on the same footing from the beginning. Uh, we also have a legislative system that relies on bringing everyone to the table and finding a compromise. It sounds good, but in practice, whoever has the best lawyers and biggest bags of money on that table ends up winning. So it's time we build a new table. And I think a lot about this, like, oh, what can we do? Like, do we just gotta testify? Honestly, I'll tell you, it helps to hear stories of Kanaka Maoli in the hearing room. And we might even pass the bill through that committee. And then somehow it dies behind the scenes when everybody's back at work, right? So what, what does power really look like? When one side is testifying and the other side is testifying but also slipping you checks um, for your next campaign, um, how do we compete against that? Right? And the answer is organize, organize, and organize. And when you look at what's happening right now in Mauna Kea, given no matter what stance you are, if you can support TMT, you have to recognize the power 
that's happening right now with the mobilization in our Lahui. And in order to expand that out, it's not just always playing by their rules. And who can be, can Hawaiians be better haole than haoles? No, we can't. Um, but we can unabashedly be ourselves. That's what Lana Kila does every protocol three times a day on the Mauna. We can speak our native language, we can speak for our kupuna every chance we get. That's what Ko'okakahi does every time he gets up and gives a testimony. Um, we can find solidarity in other people's struggles, be it climate change, be it standing rock, draw light to our struggles and find new allies, even outside of Hawaii. That's what anti Pua case has done over the last four years. So to build real political power, we have to harness moments like this. So in Mauna Kea, I was, I'm on the board of the bail fund, right? The, the week our kupuna got arrested, we were able to shoot a video, we were able to get that out, um, you know, because of my campaign last year, I was able to get Bernie, Warren, um, Ocasio to retweet the video with a link to the Bell Fund. Within one week, we raised $200,000 for this Bell Fund. Which means, which means even if they were to arrest 1,000 Kia'i at one time, um, we could get them out. And once that money, once they go to court and that money revolves back because Bell money gets returned, then we can say what's next. We can get out all the Kanaka Maoli that are in prison for petty theft, for crimes of poverty, for experiencing homelessness, and empty a prison. We won't need a new old triple C, right? So, so when we have these moments, when we organize, it's not just the old school, one-on-one -on -one Alinsky style organizing meeting. That's, that's important, but it's also you need to harness these, moment, these moments of momentum and power. And actually, I'll be doing a presentation after this at 315 uh, specifically about this. Um, when the Zuckerberg thing happened, I, I really wish we had the digital infrastructure ready to go for NHLC because that was an international um, spotlight. We could have raised lots and lots of money to so people like Alan have help because they're doing God's work, you know? Um, the, the, the last thing I want to talk about is the system when you look at what's happening in Mauna Kea and why it's so, so successful, it's also because we weren't afraid to take direct action, nonviolent civil disobedience. And that's what Kiyomo Hukapu did as well. And when you look at what Zuckerberg does, when you have 700 acres and you're blocking 13 acres of Kuleana land, and you, you can just, by the way, he could have just gave that 13 and said, you know what, I'll carve out, you guys figure out what to do with this. But he's so greedy that he goes, no, I'm gonna put a keep out sign right around you guys. Um, what he's doing by putting up that keep out sign is civil disobedience. He's breaking the law right there, right? So what Kiyomoku is doing by saying, no, I'm gonna take the keys back, it's the same thing they're doing. But for some reason, they're gonna paint you as a lawbreaker because you're the Kanaka Maoli, right? So let's remember that we might not always have the political, um, scales on our side. We might not have the thumb on the scales like they do, but we have Pono on our side. We have the moral argument almost 100% of the times when it comes to these Aina issues. Alan, you can, if you can just share and then we'll go to Lance and Kiamoku will have the last. Well, I think the, the features that, of the bill that we talk about, you want to talk about the bill, right? Oh, yeah, if you want, that, that would be great too. If you support the bill or if you see some good things in the bill that... Well, I gotta preface what I'm gonna say with this comment. Um, you know, years ago, the legislature did ask the Native Legal Corporation to come up with kind of a report as to what would be a way to lessen the burden on Hawaiian families who were faced with all of these quiet title actions at the time. Thank heavens, it's kind of diminished in volume since then. Um, but because of the very nature of property, which you cannot deprive people with without due compensation, and basically due process rights so that everybody who's supposed to be a, a co-owner has the right to both notice and the ability to show up in court and argue their points on uh, ownership rights. Um, the process gets very complicated. It gets very complicated because of the masses of people that can get involved with what we call the fractionated interest of property in general. And you have generations passing down uh, 
um, where they typically do not consolidate their interest in one person in the next generation. It goes down to four people, then of those four people, each one of them goes down to five people, and each one of them goes down to another four people. I mean, but by the time all this fractionation occurs, it's very difficult to manage any kind of quiet title case when you have the minority interest in the, in the property. Um, at times, we've been able to represent people so that they can carve out their share, and that's the best situation, because then we can feel that we've represented Hawaiians to keep their land. But so many times, the problem becomes that because of the small interest involved in the, in the, in the clients we represent, we have no choice but to do the best we can about managing how the property is ultimately going to be sold so that everybody takes their percentage share in the proceeds to that sale. Now, I don't know how to stop that um, because those limitations are imposed by county government uh, uh, restrictions on zoning, which, uh, which require a certain amount of land to be uh, parceled out based on whatever the zoning is. In other words, so if you have 10 acres of land and uh, you know, you're interested in it, there's only a, uh, one ten, uh, less than one-tenth of, of that. And the zoning only allows for, for carving up that land into uh, two-acre parcels. You don't, you don't have a right to get a particular parcel because you have less than one-tenth of the land. So it becomes a real problem because we're, we're bound to follow the county zoning rules and regulations on what, how much property can be carved up for that particular family. And so I don't know how to fix that, but because there's this, the very bedrock of our own government is to give counties their kuleana to regulate lands and to manage lands, to zone lands, and the state is bound, is bound itself to follow those particular county regulations. So that's one big problem, I don't know how to overcome it. But it is a problem because it restricts our ability to be able to carve out parcels of land that could represent a share in a particular Ohana's interest. Um, I like the part about, especially with Kuleana owners, not having to pay costs and attorney's fees, which is currently uh, allowed but uh, for a judge to award that based on equitable considerations of how much each person in the litigation has to bear in terms of the attorney's costs and fees. Um, but because the Kuleana are generally so small, it's really, really unfair to put this on people who have minority interests in land, really in any kind of land, but in Kuleana in particular because you know the, already the acreage, acreage is so small, there's not a lot of people you can assign it to these costs too. So I think that that would help um, those that have interest in Kuleana and avoid some of the problems that Kiamoku probably fought, faced in <coughs> potentially having to be uh, assessed costs and fees against them at the end of a, a quiet title litigation. Um, I think it's always helpful to have mediation as this proposes, but much of the time I can't see why a big landowner comes in piece of property for Kuleana, for example, in order to make his estate whole, would you know, necessarily have much uh, pressure to do that. Yeah. So that, that probably needs some thought, but wouldn't be, probably wouldn't hurt. Um, I, those are some of my comments. Thank you, thank you, Alan. Lance? I think the, uh, at least uh, in my view, I think the most important thing uh, for Kuleana lands is for everybody to um, clear up and become more familiar with their mo'okuauhau um, because I can, I can say with almost certainty that if you are Hawaiian, you have an undivided interest in one, at least one land commission award somewhere. And if you don't know what that number is, that means that you need to work on your mo'okuauhau. That's all it means. And I think the importance of that, not just to be able to connect to those lands, is, but also in the process of clarifying what your mo'okuauhau is, that's the opportunity for your kupuna to talk to you. It's the easiest way, because sometimes you have dreams and you have no idea what it's saying. But you'd be surprised when you go through this process 
uh, you get quite the direct call <laughs> from the operator herself. Um, and so I think that that's, for Kuliana Lands, that's the most important thing that, that each person can do for themselves and for their family, is to be clear uh, uh, with that. Um, I think a close second um, would be to really push for more funding for Native Hawaiian Legal Corporation. I'm not sure if all of you folks are aware, but over the last seven years, the amount of funding that has gone to nonprofit legal services in this state has been cut in half. So you want to know why like folks can't get help, and that's because the number of lawyers uh, that can help on a nonprofit basis has been cut in half in the last seven years. So uh, one of the most concrete things you can do in the political process is to get uh, organizations like Native Hawaiian Legal Corporation uh, their funding restored and an increase in funding because there's only so many human beings in that office and they can only ethically take on so many cases at once and I think they're probably all of them are pretty close to max if, if not already. Um, with respect to this bill, uh, I just wanted to tell one little story about people who say like, well what's the big deal about not being able to recover costs? So I had a case of a Kuliana land in uh, Honolulu about almost 15 years ago, and there were about 100 cousins and aunties that each had an interest. I actually represented a Hawaiian family that wasn't related to them, but in the 50s, they father got a really small interest and so forth um, from one of, the, one of the family members. And they settled the genealogy. It was Maui Land and Pine was the one that was pushing uh, uh, to get this sold. It turned out actually their interest was fake and then they found the cousin that was on the outs with everybody else and bought his interest and got back in the case. Um, and then they, then they had no money. Then, 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 it, then they went bankrupt or whatever happened uh, during the, the uh, crisis. So at that point, then uh, it was too small to subdivide and so it went to a partition sale. And it didn't, the partition sale, it wasn't a lot of money. And then Maui Land and Pine, of course, had no money at this point. They really wanted their costs back. And everybody got zero, except for Maui Land and Pine's attorney, because just the costs of going through the lawsuit was more than the amount of money that the partition cell had. So not only did nobody end up with the land, nobody ended up with anything, except for Maui Land and Pine's attorney. And I don't think he, his bill actually was completely paid either. Well, I'm sure his bill was paid by Maui Land and Pine, but it wasn't reimbursed for the court. So this thing about the plaintiff shall not recover costs for family lands uh, it can end up being very significant. Um, it's not, this isn't just like a $300 filing fee or you know, $1,000 worth of copies or something. It, it can end up being quite a bit of money in a land case. So, um, yeah. Thank you, Lance. Thank you very much. And then we wanna, I wanna give the last word to Kia Moku, of course, who's on the front line every day. Um, it's all about identity, literally. Because when you're being summoned to court, there is somebody, yeah, and their job literally is to prove you're not the person you claim to be. So, you think about that. It's not about land, it's about identity. It's about somebody saying that what you had, or what you think you had, you never had to begin with because you can't even prove today who you actually are. And that happened to me. Talk about physically, spiritually distort when you're standing in a court and you have an attorney literally chastising you on your connection to your kupuna, saying that this is not the person that is the person that should be in front of us. So for me, I represent a whole legacy of my mo'oku apau. So I stand at the front line to make sure that I'm identified as being the so-called heir to everything or whatever it is that was left behind by Al Kubuna. And without that, you know, I, I think everybody got to ask themselves the question, is it worth it? Is it worth the property or is it worth your genealogy? You got to really think about that a lot. For me, I tell everybody, I just a motor. Somebody else driving my car. 
And that's my kubuna. I know that he's at my back and he's at my front. Because every time I walk in that courthouse, yeah, I know he's around me, he protects me. Because there's somebody there, yeah, that wants to eradicate me and genocide me and take me out of the equation. So when I look at the process before me, it's unfair. Especially when, you know, when Alan was talking about, you know, everybody's on the outside of the courthouse and they're waiting for the petition of land for sale so everybody bids on property. That's an unfair process, but when it comes to Native Hawaiians, we're at a percentage and of an undivided interest where that kind of fears everybody to think that, okay, I like for me, my immediate family, my sisters, my brothers, okay, they get kids. Me, I get four kids, yeah? I'm the run of the family, like I said. But when, when you start breaking it down into terms of math, mathematical kind of things, does, that, does it really, really matter? That we're going literally identify who basically has an interest or the more important part is how we relate it intimately and how we really need to this this could actually bring us together to find solutions where we can go forward as an ohana right now today believe me how many of you sit at the dinner table with your whole ohana every night how many of you still today? Raise your hands. Okay. So because of that, I think our whole mentality of thinking you know, on how we related intimately as an Ohana unit, we forgetting the common values of Aloha Aina, Aloha Ohana, all because the political regime that we live in it's competitive to us to think that there is a greater cause for us as Kanaka Maoli in this room. But then at the same time, you know, that's, that's why every time I hear the brains and the, the scholars and all that talk, I always scratching down stuff because I, I know one day I won't need that language because I know they're going to attack us laterally, laterally, unilaterally, all because they want to scratch us off the face of the earth. We the host culture. There are laws that were, were made to protect us, our interests and all that, and it all boils down to whether or not we can get an exemption from the Office of Hawaiian Affairs so we don't have to pay taxes for Kuli and all that. I'm still waiting on that kind of thing, but does it really matter on whether or not I'm going to be subjected to paying for Kuliana land taxes when I know that sometime in 1878 that the government pay, uh, took one of the portions of our property from Apanawa, three Apanas took one Apana for paying for the commutation fees of the properties back then. Does those laws still apply? And I, I read um, the Indices Awards. I read the whole thing. Anybody ever heard of the Indices Awards? Raise your hands. Oh. Oh God, okay. Look them up and read them. I read that five times. And everything that's happening within the government and how everybody foresees the real estate business of lands and all that kind of stuff, I don't agree with it. We're overthrown. Our crown, our kingdom, the president in 1993 signed an apology bill for the illegal overthrow of the kingdom of Hawaii. All those kind of things come to me when I start looking at Kuleana lands on the benefit of Kuleana for myself. So it's all about identity. It's all about who we were and who we still are. I still feel that we still are who we were. You know, so that drives me to know that I'm not going to have some foreigner from some other country who bought 5,000 acres for $15 million with a warranty title deed, chop off these lands and create one quick claim. And then I'm worried about how many heirs could be entitled to that on an undivided interest. This Malahini is coming over here to invade us. So my pursuit in making sure that we help um, Kuleana stay on Kuleana lands. Whatever effort is needed, whether or not it's through the legislation, I think the legislation 
should really look into ways of how we can protect our interests and it doesn't have to boil down to 2,000 people that have an undivided interest versus going outside of a courthouse watching somebody auction the property off with a quick then later on create a quick claim just so they can sell them off again for the twice amount of money that they bought it for to begin with. So the, the, the process in the state of Hawaii, sorry, if I didn't jump in this so-called kuleana of mind, I would never have known my true identity as a Kanaka Maoli. And that's where I stand, and that's why I always want to stand. I want to stand in the righteousness to know that our Kubuna left something for us, something behind for us, and helping other families reconnect. That's my kuleana. And I, and, I, and I accept that Juliana greatly with the help of my scholars before me. Thank you. Mahalo, Thank you. Um, can we give all our speakers a round of applause? Um, for So it was brought up a couple times that we, we should be um, fundraising and donating to Native Hawaiian Legal Court. And so Kalahui Hawaii Political Action Committee is making a donation today. Um, we're giving it to Alan. Um, we were selling these pareos, and that was our fundraiser for Native Hawaiian Legal Court. So we are giving him um, part of the, the profits of that. Um, we want to mahalo all of our speakers um, from Maui and Alan. Uh, for coming, and Alan wanted me to make sure that I also let you know about the um, tax exemption registration that you can go through OHA. OHA has, if you go on their website, it's just like a, they have a Kuleana land page, and it's just some information. There's one person in that office that does Kuleana tax exemption, and that's Lucy Myers. So she's a big expert on genealogy, and that was one of one of the things Lance had, had um, shared. It's one of the first things we must do. So. Um, can, we, can you close this up? Ma, uh, ma, oh, that's good. <laughs> but um, yeah, so we, I just want to just mahalo, but here's our donation. Okay, um, Kemoku, can you close us up with um, okay. Pule? Sure. Mahalo. You know, before I do, uh, we were here, me and my wife was here from last week, Sunday. We was invited to a conference on the ocean observance. And it was uh, 57 indigenous people throughout Alaska, Canada, um, Vanuatu, Kiribati, Rorotonga, Tonga, all these people. And we sat at the table at 100, with 150 scientists trying to figure out how we can incorporate traditional knowledge versus the scientific knowledge. and. Sometimes I gotta remind myself, but they put me under the bus because they never know how to open culturally and traditionally. So I would kind of help facilitate that part. So being put on the bus many times, I, I think that's part of my kuleana. <laughs> that these 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 things need to be done in order for create clarity and make sure that our kupuna is well rested to know that we're still being perpetual. So I wonder when Pule talks about um, when the tree grows and the leaves form and the flower blooms and a seed falls and another Pula Pula grows again, making things continue. Continue, so life is continue. All because of the dire need of our Kanaka Maoli to stand up and rise up. No. No. One generation to the next, just rise up. No. From the Kupuna to the Makua to the Kamaliki tomorrow that we will always be here in perseverance to everything that is dear to us, our aina, our kai, our ohana. E ke akua noa e akua i ke akua poko akua loa e vehi kalani. Kau hola kalani. Kau hola kalani. Va vahi kalani. Va vahi kalani. E pula ni ha ku i kau mai la e luna e hu. Aua mai la ua, a kupu mai la kupu, a muo mai la muo, a liho mai la liho, a lau mai la lau, a la la mai la la la, a kumu mai la kumu, a kumu ka ahi na ore. E ho ulu mai, e ho ulu mai, a ulu mai la e. Ahi leo vale no hue. I'm
Mahalo everyone for coming. Mahalo Kiamoko, mahalo to our speakers, and mahalo to CNJ for giving us this space. Mahalo to Kukio Lewis who's here, mahalo. <laughs> Thank you everyone, and um, we would appreciate your help. We'll be in contact with you.